Timing matters. You can give advice way too soon after someone's made a bad decision. You can crack a joke about a disaster too soon, apparently. You can celebrate prematurely. I ride a bicycle and I love watching those uh, cycling videos where at some big European race, somebody's in the, at the finish line and the rider puts his hands up and he's celebrating and while he does, somebody drives by and steals the victory. Or the uh, football player with the 95 yard touchdown pass and he's hot dogging it and spikes the ball just before he crosses the goal line. You can definitely also try to give sentimental platitudes and uh, comfort too soon at a funeral to a grieving spouse. I got a pro tip for you at funerals. If you ever feel pressured to just come up with something to say, you probably just shouldn't say anything. Well, Psalm 75 teaches us that if we believe God is who he says he is, if we believe he hasn't changed toward us, then even in the darkest times, we can still give him praise. Um, when, when it seems by all earthly circumstances that there's no justice toward his enemies, we can remain confident that God is still in control. We can praise him in advance for what he's going to do. Because when God promises to do anything, it is 100% guaranteed. So we can praise him, thank him in advance. There are no premature worship experiences when it comes to our relationship with God. But to what end? What's the point of this uh, idea that I'm bringing across and we're going to look at in our psalm today? Well, the answer to that is the difference between religion and biblical Christianity. And it's also a landmine for me. Um, it's a landmine for me because it's a temptation to try to find something to say to people that are living in the midst of a worldwide pandemic. It's sort of a failed reason why I even started this whole series um, that we're looking at this little playlist of Psalms um, that are written in the context of the children of Israel being taken off into captivity because I thought surely here I'm gonna find some helpful things that'll make people um, bring them some hope in a time where, where hope is hard to find. And, uh, but uh, I have a feeling though that that's what I thought I was going to be doing. And as I've started getting into these Psalms, I know something different happening in my heart for sure. It's almost as if God cut me off on the way to what I thought I was going to do and redirected my thinking. I mentioned just last week that the Psalms are meant to form us and not just inform us. And little did I know there was more coming out of my mouth than, than I even realized. It uh, reminds me uh, of a time and many years ago where uh, a young man was commiserating that there wasn't more happening at our church. That's always a fun conversation for a pastor to go through. But I responded to him in pointing out a number of things happening in people's lives. Well, there's this example and there's this and there's this and, and what about this? And his response back to me was, was something like I'm paraphrasing here. It's like, yeah, but none of those things were caused by anything that we're doing as a church. I thought about that and something popped out of me next that I really can't claim credit for, but I haven't really been able to shake it ever since in the last 12 or 13 years. It, it, I said something like this. I find that real ministry is usually something that happens on the way to what we thought we were going to do. I feel as if these Psalms that we're studying are having that same effect on me, and I hope and pray they're having the same effect on you. So my apologies up front if I don't provide you this morning with uh, some kind of tools in your hands that can make your life work better during a pandemic. I think any of those things that I could say are really second order things and not first order things. I think they're the kinds of things that if we're not careful, we would settle for in a heartbeat, except our hearts beat for something much more significant. So they'll never really satisfy. And that is to find God in the midst of, and often in spite of our circumstances. So let's read our uh, Psalm for this week and uh, see what we can find, shall we? We're looking at Psalm 75 this morning. We praise you, God. We praise you for your name is near. P 
people tell of your wonderful deeds. You say, I choose the appointed time. It is I who judge with equity. When the earth and all its people quake, it is I who hold its pillars firm. To the arrogant, I say, boast no more. And to the wicked, do not lift up your horns. Do not lift your horns against heaven. Do not speak so defiantly. No one from the east or west or from the desert can exalt themselves. It is God who judges. He brings down one, he exalts another. In the hand of the Lord is a cup full of foaming wine mixed with spices. He pours it out and all the wicked of the earth drink it down to the dregs. As for me, I will declare this forever. I will sing praise to the God of Jacob who says, I will cut off the horns of all the wicked, but the horns of the righteous will be lifted up. Context is everything. You have to remember that uh, these are captivity tunes, crisis tunes. The very first verse in this psalm, when we read it, we praise you, God. We praise you for your name is near. People tell of your wonderful deeds. This is actually not a psalm that's written for a 50th wedding anniversary celebration or some kind of a victory parade. These are the opening words of a prayer for people looking into the eyes of a national crisis. Great loss of life and property and freedom and security. It's been described as a thanks prayer and that the depth of such a prayer is this one that we've read this morning and that I would like you to continue to pray to yourself and to God, I should say, this week, the depth of faith is, is this. It's the fact that the thanks and the praise are given before the problem is even solved. In light of who we know God to be, thanksgiving and praise should come out of us as naturally as the color yellow comes out of dandelions. Last, two weeks ago, uh, we talked about, uh, uh, we parked on a line uh, in, a, in Psalm 70, Three that said, it is good to be near God. Well, our psalm this time tells us that we praise you because your name is near. And that's saying the same thing. It, God's name means God's very person. It, it means who he really is. So we pray to, we sing about a God that's not hidden himself, hasn't hidden his identity from us. He's revealed who he is and how he works and he's described elsewhere in scripture as a present help in times of trouble. People tell of his wonderful deeds, i.e. we tell of his wonderful deeds. Way down in verse 9, we see um, the other, if, if this opening verse is one side of a set of brackets, verse 9 is probably the other side of the brackets, where it says, I will sing praise, I will declare this forever, I will sing praise to the God of Jacob. So these are two brackets of praise, and everything inside those brackets is in the context of things that we praise God for. But the interesting thing is they are very difficult things for us to often be thankful for or to offer praise for. Um, let's move on and we'll see what that means. In verses two to three, these verses wrestle with or, or maybe they clarify the answer to the great question in a crisis of any kind. And that's this question, who's in charge here? You say, I chose the appointed time. It is I who judge with equity. When the earth and all its people quake, it is I who hold its pillars firm. Those two words in the translation I read, you say, those are additions. They're not in the original um, passage of scripture. They're additions that are put in there to uh, enable us to figure out who's talking. Because if, if it just started with, I choose the appointed time, it's I who judge with equity, it might sound like some kind of gross bragging. It might be setting up a, a character like Lamech. Lamech is this um, prototype um, braggart, um, rebel against God's power that shows up in the book of Genesis. You can find him just around the Noah's Ark stories. 
And that's not it at all. So, you know, the translators are helping us realize this is something God is claiming about himself. And what is it that God's just claimed? Well, God, in these two verses, reveals himself as the one who's holding it all together in verse 3. He's the one who's in charge of the schedule, verse 2, and the standards of right and wrong even in verse 2. Well, let's go with the timing one first. Last week I said that two of the most mystifying things about God to us are his timing and his purposes. Well, this psalm suggests to us that there's a great difference between not knowing when God will act and not knowing if God will act. We have absolutely no reason to despair and wonder if God will ever right wrongs, if God will ever bring justice, if God will ever bring salvation for his people. There's a big difference between knowing, not knowing when God will act and not knowing if God will act. Well, here's something that's inside these praiseworthy factors. It's the idea that God controls the timing of when he does things, even including judgment. We'll come back to that. But, but time itself, God controls the time. We see this in other Psalms. Uh, one familiar passage is, you are my God, my times are in your hands. So the Psalms talk about this idea a lot as something worth praise. Um, each of the things he praises God for in this Psalm, he's thanking him for, He's, that he's confident he's going to do each and every one of these things. We're currently in the dark about so many when questions in our situation, if you think about it. Um, Psalm 75 reminds us that God chooses the appointed times. I thought about this this week, about the idea that, you know, I, I love to be able to consider myself one of God's chosen people. Um, I love passages of scripture, like the, when the Apostle Paul talks in the New Testament about the church and about God's people, saying that we were chosen before the foundations of the earth. Love that. Could just shower and revel in that all the time. How amazing is it that God chose me? Well, you know what I discovered that uh, though I praise him so easily for the unmerited favor that God would even consider choosing me, but for some unexplained reason he did, and I'm so fortunate and God's so amazing that he chose me, is that there are another, a, a number of other things that God chooses that I'm not always so thankful for. I, I suffer from a common chosen person problem, and that's a tendency um, to default into an approach in my life with God that sounds a little bit like this. Thanks God for making that choice, but I'll take it from here. People are not the only things that God reserves the right to choose. He chooses many other things, including the appointed time. God makes the appointments and we experience them. We're not the schedulers. It is I who judge with equity, fairness, God says. Well, there's another warning for us there. This is also not something that we're always thankful for, naturally. It's that God chooses, reserves the right to even define what is equity, what is fair in his judgments. How about holding it all together? Still the same God, the same one, our God. The arrogant are going to be uh, discussed in the next couple of verses, but the arrogant, they actually believe that they hold the world together. And let's face it, um, they are not simply them. I, I know it's poor English, but uh, we have to admit, them are us. I know it's poor English, but when it comes to our passion for control, we struggle with the idea that God is holding the world together. Um, perhaps if we don't miss it in our current situation, the, the delays, the difficulties that we're going through right now could possibly bear fruit in our lives to break away from our gripping cold fingers, the passion for controlling all things that we struggle with so much. But that remains to be seen. Look at this verse. When the earth and all its people quake, it is I who hold its pillars firm. 
Contrast that, because that's kind of nice, right, to think of, that God's holding these pillars, holding up the world we live in, and, and He's holding on to things. He's holding it all together. That's, that's a great picture. But there's a flip side to it as well. In one of the Old Testament prophets, Haggai, in chapter 2, we read this. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. And in the New Testament letter to the Hebrews, there, the author quotes that verse from Haggai and even adds some Holy Ghost inspired commentary on that verse. Take a look at Hebrews chapter 12. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, here's the quote, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. And in verse 27, the author goes on to say, the words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. That's a kind of a confusing verse, but it kind of says, you know, in that warning prophecy, that God's going to shake everything loose that's not going to last for all eternity. And all that's going to remain is what is part of God's plan, God's kingdom that will last for all eternity. So God seems to also reserve the right to be both the shaker and the stabilizer. All that to say that none of the COVID-19 crisis is beyond his control, but it will ultimately serve his ends, just like everything else. Now in your Bible, you may see a word right there next in our Psalm that simply says Selah. I didn't even include it as I put my slides together. Nobody really knows what this little word Selah really means. It's some kind of a break and you know, it's a song to be sung. So in my guess, since I grew up in the seventies, I probably would translate it as guitar solo. But if you think about it, an instrumental interlude should really give a person a chance to pause and reflect on what they've just been praying, singing, praising God for. It's like sometimes our song leaders will stop and say, have you been thinking about what you've just been saying with your own mouth? Well, what is it? Do you see this vision of what we've just read? God is on top of everything and he's under and behind everything, shaking, stabilizing, holding it all together. He's bigger than all of it. That should put each one of us in our proper place but that's not often the case. So verses four and five point toward the arrogant. I said I was gonna bring them up and here we go. Verses four and five. To the arrogant I say, boast no more. And to the wicked, do not lift up your horns. Do not lift your horns against heaven. Do not speak so defiantly. That's a warning right there. It, 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 uh, it's, it's kind of a don't even think about it kind of warning. Horns are the symbol of power and strength and lifting up horns and blasting. We think of, a, of an ancient warrior, uh, an ancient war picture idea of, you know, tribes about to take over a city and they blow that big ram's horn to intimidate the city that they're about to lay siege to or the army they're about to attack. And God's saying, it's, it's not like a dirty hairy egging them on saying, go ahead, make my day. It's more of that image, you know, where the stronger man in the movie that you're watching, uh, the criminals come around and they don't know who they're dealing with. And he just kind of says calmly, I wouldn't do that if I were you. That's the warning here from God's word to the arrogant, the defiant, the people that say there is no God. He's not in control. God warns them, don't lift up your horn toward heaven. Don't be pushy, self-willed, arrogant. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, Jesus' brother James would later write, and he will lift you up. In other words, don't do your own lifting. Look down at verse 7. It appears there's, a, there's another choice that God makes, and that's the choice of who gets lifted up and who gets put down. I'll come back to that verse in a second as well. Because right here in about the middle is this strange little verse 6. No one from the east or the west or from the desert can exalt themselves. Uh, this one was a struggle for me to figure out this week, to, to be honest with you. And there's a lot more going on in verse 6 than I first realized. 
I spoke just a last sermon or two ago about um, orienteering, getting your bearings, finding your spot with a compass. Well, this verse is connected with the idea of exalting, of exalting ourselves. There was just the warnings to the arrogant. Now it's talking about exalting. And the very next verse is going to talk about God exalting the righteous. So is this a, a verse that unlocks, okay, here's how to get ahead. Here's how to get exalted. There's that temptation I talked about of religion. Like, is this actually saying to us now, here's how you can uh, use God to your advantage to get ahead in life. Don't just look at this as the Bible's secret path for getting yourself exalted. It's interesting what is mentioned in this metaphor, east and west and south. I realize I really didn't read the word south, but from my studies this week, the idea of from the east and the west, don't look to the east or the west for someone that can exalt themselves or to, this, to the desert, that the barren place in this metaphor, it really means south. And then I got thinking, well, how come north isn't mentioned? Is it, uh, does that mean that, you know, no one from the east or the west or the south can exalt themselves, but people from the north can? If, if that's the case, this is a great verse for Canadians, you could say, but I think this is more on point. You can look from one end of the world to the other, from the east to the west, and you will not find anyone who can lift themselves up. Looking to the desert, in this context, I, again, I said, I've said, I've read that that's south. It, it's also kind of a picture of seeking wisdom in the barren place, out in solitude, a desert dwelling. But what about the missing north? Well, it's always kind of risky uh, to be um, speaking from silence. But I've learned from some study this week that the ancient Hebrew word for north is also used for secret or hidden. I even found a rabbi who's quoted with this saying, he who desires to be wise should turn to the south, but he who desires to be rich should turn to the north, with the idea of turning to the north where there's this treasure being found, something, some mysterious treasure to be found. And uh, I, I'd love to just jump right in on this with a magnetic compass as an explanation, but unfortunately, magnetic north wasn't even discovered until 2,000 years ago by the Chinese and the use of magnetic north for na navigation didn't even happen until the 12th century. But having said that, I find it interesting that life is described as not being found looking from the east or the west or from the south. Can I say to you, and I know I'm on thin ice textually here, that God's glory is your true magnetic north. Struggling to find the right way to turn in a time of confusion? Well, what brings God the most glory? With God as your true north, you will indeed find your bearings. No one east or west is worthy, nor to the south. Looking elsewhere is the only place you'll find the ultimate glory. You find your proper place. Where are you looking in this time of crisis? Because this passage is saying you're not going to find it anywhere. You're not going to find it anywhere on this earth. From the east to the west or to the desert. Look at our very next verse, verse 7. It is God who judges. He brings one down. He exalts another. So whether I'm right on this pointing north idea or not, verse 7 clarifies it. There's nowhere else to look but to God whether there's a crisis on or not. I've been haunted this past week by something I've read. And it's, it's almost described as two different hungers. And uh, I've got this quote so you can read them behind me. Uh, one, of, one of these hungers or a life direction or the kind of a compass that somebody is working by is, is this one. I want to do something that will make my life better. I want to do something that will make my life better. That's religion right there. That's the definition of religion. But the other compass is this. I want to experience God through whatever means he provides and keep trusting him whether life gets better or not. That's the walk of faith. Here's what I'm getting at. If our doors were still open here at Renaissance, 
and you had just walked through them this Sunday morning on the way to a worship service. Um, which one of those statements would describe your motivation for even being in a place like this? If our worship team were still working this morning, they'd be doing their very best to lead you to exalt God together. But what would be your motivation for doing so? Let me read a little bit of a strange quotation from C.S. Lewis. Uh, it's going to get down to uh, the, uh, one little quote that I've used many times before, but I, to be honest with you, never really looked into the context. And this is where he talks about the kind of universal principle of when you settle for something smaller, you don't even really get to enjoy the smaller thing. Here's, here's how he starts. The woman who makes a dog the center of her life loses in the end not only her human usefulness and dignity, but even the proper pleasure of dog keeping. The man who makes alcohol his chief good loses not only his job, but his palate and all power of enjoying the earlier and only pleasurable levels of intoxication. It's a glorious thing to feel for a moment or two that the whole meaning of the universe is summed up in one woman. Glorious so long as other duties and pleasures keep tearing you away from her. But clear the decks and so arrange your life, he says it's sometimes feasible, that you'll have nothing to do but contemplate her and what happens. Of course, this law has been discovered before, but it, still stand, it will still stand rediscovery. It may be stated as follows. Every preference of a small good to a great or a partial good to a total good involves the loss of the small or partial good for which the sacrifice has made. I know this sounds pretty complicated, but it's going to get clear. He says this, apparently the world is made that way. You can't get second things by putting them first. You can get second things only by putting first things first. And then in a letter to a friend in 1951, he was able to boil that down very succinctly. And that's the quote I have for you here. Put first things first and we get second things thrown in. Put second things first and we lose both first and second things. How about you? Are there areas of your life where you've been putting second things first? Isn't our current situation that we're in right now kind of a pretty strong little boot camp we're all in right now to really get to the core of where our longings are directing us for our satisfaction? Whether it's the first things of the name of God, or it is good for me to be near God, or is it the second things? Let's continue on. Verse 8. This is one of those things that are, remember, these are still the brackets of praise. Everything inside these brackets causes this poet singer to praise the God of Jacob. Listen to this one. In the hand of the Lord is a cup, full of foaming wine mixed with spices. He pours it out and all the wicked of the world drink it down to its very dregs. We may not be all that familiar with symbolism of the cup, maybe the side effect of so many leaf fans in our neighborhoods, I'm not sure. But the cup in the Bible can refer to something fantastic and a blessing, but it can also be a symbol of punishment wrath, and judgment. On the one hand, we think of Psalm 23 that we've looked at recently, how, you know, my, my cup overflows. Well, that's, that's a good thing. Psalm 116 speaks of the cup of salvation. Again, another very good thing. But our passage this morning, along with many others in the Old Testament, and this is important, the New Testament, regularly speak of God's wrath being held back temporarily, but that it will be served up, poured out. This awaits the wicked. You can think of it as a universal unhappy hour that the appointed scheduler has scheduled. Remember him a few verses back? The one who alone has the power, whose plans always come to fruition at his appointed time, that he alone lifts one up, but he will just as surely take others down. 
The point is, my friends, there is a cup of salvation available now while supplies last, but there seems to be enough of the second cup for everyone when God's appointed time to pour it out arrives. It's interesting if you think of it that even the Lord's Supper involves a cup, a cup of wine. And if you look at 1 Corinthians 11 this afternoon, that same cup taken wrongly is described as actually being like the Psalm 75 cup. 1 Corinthians 11 has this verse in it of warning for those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment upon themselves. However, gospel news right here, Jesus drank your serving. Back in Matthew 26, we hear Jesus praying this prayer almost exactly the same three times in the Garden of Gethsemane. Words and variation of this. My Father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. Jesus basically prays, God, if it could possibly, if I could possibly not have to drink this down. That was his prayer. But he says, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus drank your serving. It doesn't have to end this way. Verse 9, as for me, I will declare this forever. Well, what's this? He was just talking about God's judgment. Um, should we be singing more worship songs, happily anticipating the day when the wicked are choking down judgment to the dregs? No, he says, I will sing to the God of Jacob. Here, here's the idea of future grace. Remember I said that even when the circumstances completely are going south on you, you can still be confident and be thanking and praising God for what he's promised to do. Well, this is an example. It's the idea of future grace. This is a crisis song. He's not experiencing, ex he's not experiencing exaltation. Things don't seem fair. Things are not right with the world, but they will be. He does not need to fear the inevitable cup of wrath because he'll be singing in the choir at God of Jacob Baptist Church. That's a paraphrase, of course. But I always love that label or that name tag that God seems to like to wear, that he is the God of Jacob. Jacob is the least likely guy to be singled out. He spends his whole life pretty much foolishly seeking to grasp and manipulate blessing and honor and exaltation um, in some ridiculous ways, if you look at his life story. Even though he'd been chosen by God and promised from birth, really, to be the one through whom God's promise of blessing would come to the rest of the world. He's known as the wrestler when he could have been the rest-er. Well, let's look at how the God of Jacob is described. I will sing praise to the God of Jacob, who says, I will cut off the horns of the wicked, but the horns of the righteous will be lifted up. Our psalm ends with this vision of God setting all things right. I don't know how this thing that we're in right now is going to work out. It stresses me out just like it does you. But here's something that I can claim as a disciple of Christ, as a child of God, that God somehow is in control and is setting all things right. Charles Spurgeon gave this vision of how things work when everything's made right. In a rightly ordered society, good men are counted great men. Virtue confers true rank, and grace is more esteemed than gold. Grace is more esteemed than gold. Can I give you some homework this week? And that's this, pray Psalm 75. Think of this theme of lifting and being brought down, of God holding the pillars that the earth is upon, that the idea of God's cup of judgment not being something that we need to fear because of God's promises. Let's pray together. 
Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for its encouragement. I thank you for the way it forms us. Forgive us for the times when we seek to manipulate you, the greatest good, in order to protect, protect secondary things in our lives. Lord, I pray that you would give us a vision that we will forever praise the name of the God of Jacob. And this current crisis in our lives does not affect our forever. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Remember, if you're uh, from Renaissance, we'd love to see you at 1140 this morning at our After Church Fellowship. And if you're not from our church and you would like any kind of help in any way, get a hold of us on our website at brooklynrbc.ca.